Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 10, Signaling. In this lesson we'll look at some general principles of ligand binding. This process re is referred to as signal transduction because we're going to transduce a signal or convert a signal from outside to inside the cell. In each case it requires a receptor in order to receive the signal and a ligand that provides that signal. They will interact in a very specific way and that's going to create an internal response. And so it's not a simple binding in the case of just one molecule binding to another as we saw in the case of hemoglobin that binds oxygen. In this case there's a more specific interaction with ligand and receptor and that's going to generate a response. It always involves a conformational change in the receptor and that allows it to interact with other proteins or enzymes. Here's a table from your book, some examples of hormones or ligands that might bind receptors. It's not important you remember the hormones and their classes and sources, just to note that there are many different types. Some are amino acid derivatives, some are steroids, some are peptides, some are even gases, and we'll look at an example of an icosanoid as well. The idea of a hormone is a substance that's produced in one tissue, but it has its effects on multiple tissues. Let's look at a ligand binding curve, and hopefully this shape looks pretty familiar. First of all, uh, it's important to recognize that the ligand binds with very high affinity to its receptors, in a similar way that enzymes are very specific for substrates. The idea is that we want to communicate a very specific signal and we want it to have a specific effect. And so that interaction must be with high affinity so that we can communicate the signal we want to. If we look at an equilibrium of our receptor binding its ligand, here's the receptor ligand complex, then we can set up our, our very simple dissociation constant here. If we plot on our graph at the top of the screen here, the amount of receptor bound to ligand as a function of or a fraction of the total amount of receptors present and do that as a function of ligand concentration this is the type of curve that we get as you can see very familiar hyperbolic plot so if we're looking at a fraction of out of all of the receptors there how many are actually bound to ligand the highest number we could have would be one as we uh, add more and more of the ligand we get more and more binding and then we reach some saturating value which represents the point at which all of our receptors are bound to ligand. Very familiar hyperbolic plot. Well as you can imagine to get to our KD we're going to take the halfway point that is where half of the receptors are bound that will give us our value for our dissociation constant. With regards to ligand binding, the actual substance that elicits the biological effect is called the agonist. The antagonist can bind the receptor, but it doesn't trigger the response, and it would block the binding of the true agonist. Here's an example of one of my favorite agonist-antagonist pairs. Adenosine binds its receptor, and the effect is we get very, very sleepy and so the antagonist is caffeine. Although the structure is different, you can see that dual ring structure resembles very closely that adenosine base, and so it binds to the receptor and we don't get sleepy. This is how caffeine works. In our next video lesson, we want to look at two general types of receptors. We're going to compare and contrast them, and we'll look at them also in more detail.